My name is Jonathan Goforth with Keller Williams Platinum Partners. Thanks for joining me. This video is to help you pass the real estate exam. I've got 25 questions to help you practice with. They are good in all 50 states. I want you to subscribe because the rest of my channel has a lot of videos to help you succeed as a real estate agent after you pass the exam. How to make a lot of money in real estate. As soon as you start learning something, give this video a like. It just helps me feel good. At the end of this are two links to more test questions to help you practice with. And then after you pass the exam, come back, put a comment. Yay, I passed the real estate exam. It helps encourage other people. And then come back and check out my other videos on how to uh, sell houses, how to make a lot of money, how to do this, how to do that. Don't worry about that yet. Come back and do that after you pass. In the remarks of this video at the bottom, you might have to click on the word more. There are a whole bunch of links, math questions, vocabulary questions, lots and lots of links to more test questions. So check that out also. All right, I've been doing this for 26 years as a full-time real estate agent. I got to be listed in Forbes magazine in 2019, 20, and 21 as one of the top market leaders in the country. So thanks for joining me. Let's jump right in with number one. Number one, these are state-specific laws that set forth limits for interest rates in specific types of lending instruments to prevent lenders from imposing unreasonable or predatory interest rates. Number one, Regulation Z. Number two, the Federal National Mortgage Association. Number three, Usury Laws. Number four, RESPA. And your answer is Usury Laws. Number three, Usury Laws. The usury laws are state-specific laws that prevent lenders from charging high interest rates, unreasonable predatory interest rates. That is what the usury laws do. Number two, this takes all of the costs of borrowing as a percentage. Number one, the interest rate. Number two, the annual percentage rate. Number three, the amortization rate. Number four, the RESPA rate. Well, this is a nice question because you can eliminate number four easily. There's no such thing as a RESPA rate. There's no such thing as an amortization rate either. So you got it down to uh, number one and number two, the interest rate or the annual percentage rate. Your answer is number two, the annual percentage rate that takes in all of the costs of borrowing as a percentage. Number three, all written offers must be, number one, presented to the buyer, number two, presented to the local real estate board for compliance, number three, presented to the real estate, to the state real estate commission, number four, presented to the seller. And your answer is number four, presented to the seller. All written offers must be presented to the seller. Your fiduciary duty is to present all offers to your seller. Your listing agreement might even state that in your uh, responsibility to do so. Um, our uh, listing agreement here in the Midwest, it states that you are to present all offers to the seller uh, unless your seller has instructed you not to see certain offers. Um, that would be something I would probably want to get in writing from them. <laughs> that they, if it's below a certain price, stop sending me these low offers. Uh, but you are to present all written offers to the seller. Number four, an agent is showing homes to Mr. Ramirez, who has just moved here from Mexico. The agent is intentionally only showing homes to Mr. Ramirez in Hispanic neighborhoods, so he'll be more comfortable. This practice is best described as blockbusting, redlining, steering, or streamlining. Your answer is number three, steering. Number five, regarding residential property, deed restrictions can only be enforced by the court, by the police, 
by the HOA, which is uh, stands for the Home Owners Association, or number four, it can be enforced by the board governing the HOA, the Homeowners Association. So regarding residential property, deed restrictions can only be enforced by the, your answer is, number one, the court. The court would enforce deed restrictions. Number six, after getting licensed, a new realtor took on a buyer. The realtor was responsible for a chain of events that led to the sale of a property for this buyer. The realtor is legally called the benefactor, the procuring cause, the agent on record, or the supporting cause. So the realtor is legally called number two, the procuring cause. If there is ever an issue between you and another realtor over a commission dispute, the agent with the procuring cause is most likely going to prevail. That's going to be the agent who can show the strongest chain of events causing the buyer to purchase the home. That is procuring cause, something you're going to want to make sure you understand. Number seven, two weeks after going under contract to purchase a home, the buyer decides to also purchase the small empty lot connected to the backyard, also owned by the same seller. What document will be used to transfer the extra lot at the same time with the closing of the home? Number one, a contingency form. Number two, an amendment. Number three, an addendum. Number four, a seller's land disclosure. And your answer is number three, an addendum. An addendum adds to the contract. Since you're simply adding the extra lot into the contract with the house, it will be an addendum to add it. An amendment, which is number two, an amendment is used to make changes to something that's already in the contract, like changing the price or changing the closing date or changing the financing terms, something that's already in the contract that needs to be changed. That's what an amendment is for. If you're adding something into the contract along the way, it's an addendum. And you can kind of just remember at the beginning, add, you're adding something to the contract. You, you, you do need to know the difference between amendment and addendum. So that right there can count right there. Two separate questions to know the difference in both of those vocabulary terms. By the way, if you haven't already, uh, subscribe. Please subscribe. Give this one a like. And number eight, this burdens or places limits on the title to a property. Number one, an appurtenance. Number two, joint tenancy. Number three, an encumbrance. Number four, a granting clause. So your answer is number three. That is an encumbrance. An encumbrance burdens or places limits on the title to a property. Examples of encumbrances would be liens, the mortgage, easements, restrictions. All those are encumbrances that place limits on the title to a property. Number nine, these are the fees that a buyer pays to close the transaction. Number one, the seller's loan payoff. Number two, earnest money. Number three, the seller expenses and fees. And number four, closing costs. So your answer is number four, closing costs. So closing is the final step in executing a real estate transaction. I want you to remember that phrase right there. Closing is the final step in executing a real estate transaction. What is the final step in a real estate transaction? Closing. You've got to remember that. That, that right there comes out of another practice test question. 
Closing is the final step in executing a real estate transaction, and the buyer pays their closing costs on the day of closing. Number 10, a buyer just closed on a home and took out a mortgage loan with monthly payments of $1,725.40, which includes principal, interest, taxes, and insurance. The loan is for 15 years with a final payment of $32,650. What type of loan is this? Number one, a jumbo loan. Number two, a balloon payment mortgage. Number three, a reverse mortgage. Number four, a 15-year mortgage with an adjustable arm. And your answer is number two. That is a balloon payment mortgage. So a balloon is a mortgage that doesn't fully amortize over the term of the note. So it leaves a balance due at maturity. At the end of the loan, there's a balance due. And that's what we're seeing in this question. So when you see that, you know, oh, yeah, it's a balloon. That's the balloon right there at the end. The final payment is called a balloon payment because of its large size. Balloon mortgages are, uh, they're more common in commercial real estate, so you may not see them if you're going to be selling primarily residential. Uh, but you have to know the commercial loans because uh, if you're going into commercial or residential, you're taking the same real estate exam. Number 11, individual unit owners in a condominium building have what type of ownership in regards to the common areas? So some condo buildings have common areas, things such as a, a pool, um, a gym. So let's read that again. Individual unit owners in a condominium building have what type of ownership in regards to the common areas? Number one, joint tenancy. Number two, tenancy in common. Number three, collective tenancy. Number four, HOA, Homeowners Association tenancy. And your answer is number two, tenancy in common. Number 12, mortgage lenders use a debt to income ratio as a number one way of calculating a buyer's net worth or the method of determining the total amount needed for escrow or number three, a guide for setting the minimum amount of earnest money or number four, as a loan qualifying tool. So mortgage lenders use a debt to income ratio as a number four, as a loan qualifying tool. Number 13, what is the general technique of creating distances and angles between three dimensional positions of points? Number one, surveying lots exclusively zoned for multifamily construction. Number two, surveying lots in a tract of land to be built only for commercial construction. Number three, surveying. Number four, this specific method of surveying is used by the USDA in rural areas for surveying areas in preparation for septic tanks to comply with county regulations. Your answer is number three, surveying. So the purpose of a survey is to accurately measure land in a legal and fair manner. Uh, surveying is the general technique of determining three-dimensional positions of points and the distances of, and angles between them. So this question is asking for the general term. And so the answer is just surveying. So that's a good question. Now that's you know, a piece of advice when you go through a real estate exam, you got to put your put yourself in the position of the people who are writing these questions. They want to test your knowledge. So they're going to create a question and they're going to give you one correct answer. So they've got to create three wrong answers. And so, you know, 
like I've got a kid right now in high school who was studying for the ACT. And so they're teaching a lot of uh, test-taking um, concepts to help pass an exam like the ACT. So in this, read that question, what is the general technique? And that right there tells you, you can knock out number four because number four says this is a specific method. So you can tell it's that number four is not a generic technique anyway. So that's not even a correct answer. So you can knock some of these out just by reading the question, what is the general technique? And so the most general one is number three, surveying. Number 14, which of the following statements is false regarding mortgage loans for housing with federal government support? Number one, the federal government insures lending agencies against losses. Number two, a loan through the Veterans Affairs, which is the VA, may be used for financing a condo. Number three, the FHA insures loans for either single family homes or apartments. Or number four, the federal government provides funds to the lender, the lending agency. So this one's a little bit tricky. It's a little bit tough. You may not know the answer to this. And your answer is number four. All of these are true, except number four. The federal government does not supply funds directly to lending agencies. They don't do that, but they do the other three. So that's your answer right there, number four. All right, question 15. A water line broke in an apartment. What legal recourse does the tenant have? So I want to make sure you know the tenant is. You got a landlord, you got a tenant. The tenant is the renter. The tenant is paying rent to rent the apartment. So again, a water line broke in an apartment. What legal recourse does the tenant have? Number one, environmental eviction. Number two, special eviction. Number three, constructive eviction. Number four, actual eviction. This is an excellent question. You're going to learn two vocabulary words on this one. Uh, this is a good one. Um, there are two types of eviction. Actual eviction and constructive eviction. So right there, it's not number one, it's not number two. Your answer is number three, constructive eviction. So actual eviction is when the tenant stops paying and breaches the terms of the lease and the landlord evicts them. That's actual eviction. The tenant stops paying. But constructive eviction is when the landlord doesn't maintain the property in a livable condition. The tenant is released from any obligations, but they must vacate because it's uninhabitable. And that's why the answer is number three, constructive eviction, a water line broke. And so the legal recourse that the tenant has is to get out of that lease and they have to move out. But they're released from any obligation. They don't have to pay any more rent. They simply are released because it's uninhabitable. All right, if you have not liked this video yet, please give it a like, please subscribe. You'll hear me ask this many times. <laughs> Number 16, which of the following is not an essential element of a contract? Number one, the contract can be for an unlawful purpose. Number two, consideration. Number three, competent parties. Number four, offer and acceptance. So again, which of the following is not an essential element of a contract? Your answer is number one. The contract can be for an unlawful purpose. That is not allowed. You cannot do a contract for an unlawful purpose, so that would not be an essential element of a contract. Uh, consideration is something of value given. You need that. Uh, competent parties. Number three on there, you need that. Uh, they must be of legal age. They must be of sound mind. They must be alive at the time of acceptance. And then number four, uh, offer and acceptance. That's a meeting of the minds. It's another phrase you might hear related to that. Uh, the buyer and seller agree on all the terms. 
The other three, number two, three, and four, those are essential elements of a contract. So your answer is number one, because that is not an essential element. Number 17, the brother of a friend of the seller stops by the seller's house during a college graduation party. After viewing the home, this individual offers to buy it from the seller. The seller verbally accepts. This would be called, one, an option to purchase, two, valid, three, a contract, or four, unenforceable. Your answer is number four. It's unenforceable. A contract has to be in writing to be enforceable. So before we go on to the next one, a couple things. After you pass the exam, come back to one of my test question videos and just say, yay, I passed. <laughs> Whatever state you live in, all of these questions are good for all 50 states. So yes, please, it encourages everyone else who is going to be taking the exam soon that you passed um, a piece of advice because I know you're studying for this. I know you're stressed. There's a lot of anxiety brought on by studying for, a, uh, for an exam like this. And I want you to learn your material. I want you to study it over and over and over, all the material you have. And then I want you to keep practicing test questions. Go through all of my different uh, YouTube videos. There's going to be two links pop up at the end of this. I've got, if you go into the remarks of this, so you just look below this video, it might start having a description and then you'll see more. Click more and it's going to pull up a ton of links to a lot of other test question videos. Go through all of these practicing because this is the best way to test how well you know the information. Then my advice, go take the exam quickly, as fast as you can. Just go get it done. Chances are you're going to pass the first time. Get it done and then move on. <laughs> move on from this, this uh, stage in life because um, it is stressful. It's, there's a lot of anxiety studying. Um, and then come back to my channel because I'm going to post another video here in a few, oh, a few days. I'm going to make one on the very first thing a brand new agent should do. It's the thing that a new agent needs to be doing to have a huge real estate career, to make a lot of money in this. I've been doing this for 26 years. I've been a full-time realtor for 26 years. It is my dream job. Uh, it's the most lucrative career I've ever seen. And that's what a lot of my videos are about, how to make a lot of money. I've got a great one. You know, last year, my team and I, we were paid over a million dollars in commission. I've got a video on how you do that. If you go back to my channel, you'll find that. Number 18, what is the difference between a lease purchase contract and a lease option contract? Number one, a lease option is only used for commercial tenants, whereas a lease purchase is used only for residential buyers. Number two, a lease purchase contract and a lease option contract are the same thing. Number three, the difference is that the lease option only obligates the seller to sell. Number four, the difference is that the lease option only obligates the buyer to buy. Your answer is number three. Your answer is the difference is that the lease option only obligates the seller to sell. With a lease option, the buyer is not forced to buy the property if they change their mind or they cannot get financing. A lease purchase agreement commits both parties to the sale. Number 19, regarding financing, the lower the loan to value ratio, the higher the credit score or the amount that can be loaned to the buyer or the appraised value or equity. So again, regarding financing, the lower the loan to value ratio, which is, you're going to see that called the LTV, the loan to value ratio, then the higher the the answer is equity. So the lower the ratio, the higher the equity. Number 20, a Liz Pendants was recorded on a property during a lawsuit. 
The lawsuit was dropped after 60 days, but the Liz Pendens was not released. Which of the following statements best describes the current situation? Number one, the property currently has a cloud on the title. Number two, the property has a lien against it due to the Liz Pendens. Number three, the Liz Pendens was automatically released when the lawsuit was dropped. Number four, the property cannot be sold for a minimum of 180 days. Your answer is number one. The property currently has a cloud on the title. 21. During the foreclosure on a property, the following would become the priority for repayment. The mortgage lien, a judgment lien, an income tax lien, or a property tax lien. Your answer is number four a property tax lien. A property tax lien always takes priority for repayment, even over the mortgage lien. So that's one I really want to make sure that you remember. Screenshot all of these. If you have not been screenshotting these, go back, screenshot the ones that you might have struggled with. That way you don't have to watch the video over and over. You could just uh, review through images on your phone. Um, screenshot that a property tax lien that takes priority for repayments. Number 22, if advertised by itself, which of the following would violate truth in lending laws? That's what TILA stands for, truth in lending. So if advertised by itself, which of the following would violate truth in lending laws? One, Easy terms. Two, no down payment required. Three, FHA financing available. Four, assumable loan. Your answer is number two. No down payment required. So no down payment required triggers the truth in lending disclosures because it's a specific statement only about one aspect of the financing. Uh, easy terms does not trigger the regulation because it's non-specific. Number 23, an example of severance would be cutting down a large tree in the front yard and chopping it up into firewood. Number two, buying a ceiling fan and installing it in a bedroom. Number three, removing clouds on a title by paying off liens on a property. Number four, severing all encumbrances tied to a property. So an example of severance. So this question, you know, all of these are great to practice with. All of these have come from people who have taken the exam. And these are questions that they remember seeing in different forms. So these are here to help you practice. The word severance is a fantastic vocabulary word. You have got to know it. You can see it brought into a variety of different forms of uh, real estate exam questions. Uh, one thing I want to make sure you, you know going into this, because we're about to wrap up this video, I know you're stressed studying for this. You know, I was stressed years after I got licensed. You know, I got licensed back in 90, 1997 um, to become a real estate agent. Years later, just a few years ago, I went back and got my broker's license. So I had to go take the broker's exam, which is essentially about the same exam. You just need a higher score to pass. And I will tell you, it was stressful. It was a stressful exam because you're not going to use the words like severance throughout your real estate career. And so I had to go back and review everything and relearn it on. That's what led to me uh, making uh, these videos to help other people learn uh, how to do this so they can go, people like you, go past the real estate exam. So uh, an example of severance would be, number one, cutting down a large tree in the front yard and chopping it up into firewood. So the question, what is severance? So severance is going from real property to personal property, like cutting trees into, a fi into firewood. A fixture, which is another vocabulary word, a fixture is going from 
personal property to real property. So an example of a fixture would be um, installing a ceiling fan. You go, you go to Lowe's, you go to Home Depot, you buy a ceiling fan off the shelf, and then you have it installed and you attach it, and now that becomes a fixture. So that's what um, fi a fixture is going from personal property to real property. But severance is going from real property to personal property. So a tree, let's say this is a beautiful tree in the front yard. That is a fixture. It is permanent. It's attached to the property. And when you cut it down and you chop it up, you get rid of it. Now it becomes personal property. That's what severance is. Number 24, regarding antitrust laws, which action can be legally performed by a licensed real estate agent? Number one, price fixing. Two, dividing territories. Three, selling a property you have listed to a buyer who lives in a different state. Number four, conspiracy to boycott. So the big question here that you need to know what are antitrust laws? So antitrust laws essentially prohibit business practices that unreasonably deprive consumers of the benefits of competition, uh, it resulting in higher prices for products and services. Antitrust laws promote free and fair competition. That's what you need to know. Antitrust laws that they are promoting business practices that unreasonably deprive customers of competition. And so number one, price fixing is illegal. Could not do that. Number two, dividing territories. That is totally illegal. You cannot divide territories. Now let's talk about that. Your answer is three. Number three, selling a property you have listed to a buyer who lives in a different state. Number three is the answer. Um, a lot of people will pick number two. And for some reason, this one gets missed. It's, uh, it's kind of the way it's worded. It's a little tricky when you're sitting there a little stressed, have a lot of anxiety, you're skimming these questions, you're reading them quickly, and you pick number two because it can't be number three. Um, selling a property you have listed to a buyer who lives in a different state? Of course you can't do that. You'd have to be licensed in a different state. That's what people think when they skim that. That's not what that's saying. Can you sell a property you have listed to a buyer who lives in a different state? Of course you can. Yes. And that's why it's your answer. For example, let's say you are a real estate agent in Florida. You have a listing in Florida. Many of the buyers in buying property in Florida, they don't live in Florida. They're buying second properties. They live in the other 49 states. They're investing, real estate investing into uh, Florida, a beautiful uh, vacation beach condo in Florida. So yes, you can sell the property you have listed to a buyer who lives in a different state. You are not in the different state. It's the buyer who's in the different state. And so that's why number three is your answer. Number four, conspiracy to boycott. Absolutely not. That is totally illegal. Now, one and four are obvious. Those are illegal. You cannot do those. Number two, what is dividing territories? This is what that is. This is why uh, a licensed real estate agent cannot do that. For number two, so let's say this is a large metropolitan area where you live, where you are a real estate agent, there is no way that you are going to sell in the entire metropolitan area. It's too big. Let's say, for example, you live in a suburb on the south side of the metro. You are not going to go far up north to show homes. You're just not going to do it. You're going to refer those to other agents who live 30 miles up there instead. So, what this is actually saying for dividing territories, what this is referring to, let's say there's a broker in the area of the South and another broker in an office up North, and they decide to get together and they work out a deal. 
the agents in the south are not going to sell up north, period. They're going to divide the city, divide the territory. The agents up north will only be selling up north. They will not be allowed to come down. They've divided that territory. Now, regarding antitrust laws, you know, these laws are there to promote uh, competition. That's what this law does. It promotes competition. And so when you start dividing up territories, you are restricting competition. And that violates antitrust laws. Your answer is number three. And I want you to screenshot that. I want you to understand that. Very likely, very possible that you would see an antitrust law type of question on your real estate exam. Number 25. When the deed in which a buyer takes title to a property contains the following clause, subject to the existing loan. Number one, the buyer agrees to assume the loan and make the loan payments directly to the lender. Or number two, the loan is paid at closing to give free and clear title. Number three, the home might be foreclosed on if the seller does not make the loan payments on the existing loan. Or number four, the seller is relieved from any further responsibility after closing. Your answer is number three. Buying subject to means buying a home subject to the existing mortgage. It means the seller is not paying it off and the buyer is taking over the payments. The seller remains responsible for paying off the loan because it's still in the seller's name. So the seller needs to confirm that the buyer is paying their loan each month. So let's look at these other choices. So let's read the question again. When the deed in which a buyer takes title to a property contains the following clause, subject to the existing loan, number one, the buyer agrees to assume the loan and make the loan payments directly to the lender partially true. The buyer is probably going to be making the loan payments directly to the lender, but the buyer is not assuming the loan. The loan is still fully under the responsibility of the seller. It's still in the seller's name. The, the buyer is not assuming it. Number two, the loan is paid at closing to give free and clear title. It is not paid at closing. The loan continues because it's the deed says it's subject to the existing loan. That loan will continue until it's fully paid off. Um, number three is the answer. The home might be foreclosed on if the seller does not make the loan payments on the existing loan. That's very true. The buyer is supposed to be making them. But if the buyer doesn't make them and the seller doesn't make them, then the home might be foreclosed on. So it falls under the seller's responsibility to make sure those loan payments are taking place. So if the, if the seller finds out the buyer is not making payments, the seller had better start making those payments or this is going to fall back on the seller. Number four, the seller is relieved from any further responsibility after closing. No, the seller is fully responsible until that loan is paid, however many years are left. All right, that's 25 questions. Thanks so much for watching. I hope this helps you pass. Uh, this is the most awesome career ever. Please give this a like. I hope you learned not just one thing. I hope you learned a lot of things out of this video. Go back and review it. Screenshot all of them. You have full permission from me to screenshot them all. Uh, I want it to help you uh, pass the exam. I hope this helps you study more efficiently. Now there's two other videos popping up on your screen. Check those out. Give you more practice studying lots of questions. After you pass, come back and make a comment on one of my videos. Yay, I passed. <laughs> and then I want you to check out all my other videos on how to help you succeed and make a lot of money as a, a wonderful, successful real estate agent. Thanks for watching.